So today, uh, uh, our panel is operationalizing strategic seaports as a key military readiness lever. And just a few points, uh, strategic seaports, as we all know, uh, is where everything comes together. The rail, the trucks, the ships, we all meet at the ports to deploy or redeploy. Some, a few critical questions, how do strategic ports work with all modes of transport to enhance their readiness? So how do we work with the railroads? How do strategic ports work with the railroads? How do we work with the trucks to make sure that their truckers get in and out of the ports quickly and efficiently? Uh, how do we work with, with the ship lines to make sure that their ships come in and they dock promptly and they're able to load their cargo and get out? How can the fort assist, not the port, but the fort? How can the fort assist strategic ports with the coordination of equipment to and from the ship? And there's a lot of uniforms in the audience today, and they're here, uh, a lot of commanders of these uh, local, local areas that, that actually coordinate that cargo, and, and I hope uh, that they, uh, they contribute to our discussion today, because it's a very important part. If, 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 the, if the forts aren't sending the cargo in the proper time and fashion, then, then it makes our job a little bit more difficult, it makes the ship lines a little bit more difficult, the railroads, et cetera. So, Please, I encourage the, the forts to please uh, participate in our discussions. Um, how does the port balance military and commercial requirements? Um, and, and they spoke about that in panel one a little bit. Uh, I'm director of trade development for the Port of Beaumont. So I not only do military and I'm not only involved in the military part of our, of our business, but I'm also involved in the commercial part of our business and I guarantee you it's a constant balancing act between my job, which is to sell the port and to move more cargo, uh, especially when, when military cargo is slow, uh, and our operations department. Uh, Kirby uh, Dartes, who is our operations director, and I are constantly fighting uh, about issues that uh, pertain to can we accept this or can we accept that, and, and you know, the, always the answer is he's having to look uh, you know, six months down the road where I'm looking for this next big buck that we're going to make as a port authority. You know, what, what revenue can we bring in from, from this commercial business that's coming in? And, and we can't afford to leave this behind due to whatever shipment is, is, uh, is in the front. But he keeps me honest, and, and we have a good relationship, and we, uh, we usually are able to work things out. So uh, we got a great panel today. Uh, we'll, we'll move quickly. Uh, I will uh, introduce each panel member uh, before they speak, and our first panel member today is Captain Kevin Carroll. He assumed duties as Commander Sector Hampton Roads in June of 2018 after serving two years as de Deputy Commander and three years as Prevention Department Head. As Sector Commander, he had 600 Coast Guardsmen on staff and among 14 subunits in conducting Coast Guard missions in beautiful Virginia. Captain Carroll graduated from Sunny Maritime College in 1994, earning a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, Marine Transportation, and a third mate unlimited deck license. He entered the Coast Guard that same year, 1994, and uh, under the Maritime Graduate Direct Commission Program. A native of Long Island, New York. Captain, we won't hold that against you. <laughs> Captain Carroll is married to Tara Carroll of Patuxent River, Maryland. Since August of 1996, they have two children, Sean, 19 years old, and Connor, 16. Captain? Thank you very much, sir. And I'd like to express my appreciation to uh, Christopher Newport University and NTTA for having me here today to discuss this very important topic. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been in this region for a long time. Uh, I, plus, uh, I, my roots are as a merchant mariner. That's where my professional career started, was at uh, State University of New York Maritime College and uh, the importance of this mission if you look throughout our nation's history is I would say equally very, very easily qualifies as a no-fail mission. So some of the things I want to do today oh, that's the wrong one there we go boom that's me. So as captain of the port that's one of the authorities we'll talk about that in a minute that balancing act that you described there that's that's a perfect way of describing it that happens daily. Every day that balancing act happens. 
Now, for the Port of Virginia, for Sector Hampton Roads uh, AOR, which my goal before I relinquish command would be that we would be Sector Virginia. And I'll talk about that in a minute because truthfully, our mission extends all throughout the Commonwealth. There are 37 sectors nationwide, but about $242 million per day of economic impact for this nation. A uh, container that is offloaded over at the Virginia International Gateway, which is right next door, could be in Chicago in less than 24 hours. Now, the, the impact of that can't be overstated. Uh, ULCVs, ultra-large container vessels. Vessel arrivals are going down because the vessel sizes are getting bigger. Uh, just 10 years ago, they were talking about the mega ships arriving to the port, and those were to have about 9,000 TEUs. Now we're up to 14,000. For a while, we were breaking a record every week. Now, the arrival of those vessels, because of their length, because of their beam, because of our channel width and the depth, that requires an intense amount of coordination through port partners. And that is what I'm going to really express today, is that coordination, the communication lines between port partners is critical. Six tunnels, 15 bridges, seven terminals, two shipyards. Probably the largest natural deep water port one of the most viable deep water ports that we have in the nation. And I will really applaud the efforts for the Port of Virginia under the leadership of uh, Mr. Reinhardt and the VMA, uh, Virginia Maritime Association, for initiating the project. Well, you'll hear this, I'm sure you have heard it before, is wider, deeper, safer. Is that action of looking towards our approaches from the Atlantic Ocean through Thimble Shoals Channel into the heart of the port, of getting down to 55 feet. We're at 50 feet right now and widening the channels as well. That is going to improve our safety, and that is going to improve our security of this region markedly, and that's one of the things we're definitely behind. Uh, we also have the largest naval, vessel, naval base in the world, one of the largest concentrations of maritime administration and military sea lift command vessels in the nation. So this happens every day. I also have 250,000 registered recreational vessels who may make my life so interesting every day. <laughs> okay. So if you're not familiar with uh, really the sector concept that uh, happened is post 9-11, Coast Guard used to be broken up into groups and MSOs. So you had two operational commanders in one geographic region for all the various different missions. Based upon results of activities in New York under Admiral Bennis at the time, post 9-11, the Coast Guard looked to consolidate those authorities. And here are some of the basic authorities you have. The first up at the top is the Federal On-Sea Coordinator oil and hazardous material spills. Uh, SAR mission coordinator, which is probably the foundational mission, if you ask the average person on the street, what does the Coast Guard do? We save lives through search and rescue. That's one of our critical missions. The bottom three, that is really what gets to the heart of the matter, what we're here to talk about today, is Captain of the Port Authority, Federal Maritime Security Coordinator, and the officer in charge of marine inspections. Those three are very much linked towards the viability of being a strategic port and it's critically important, specifically the FMSC, because under that we have the Area Maritime Security Committee. Subcommittee of that is our Port Readiness Committee, and that is the key to success for overcoming the challenges for a very, very strong commercial port and also for a strategic port. That committee right there, and I'd like to point out, where's Bill? Bill, where are you at? There's, there's Bill Burke from the Port of Virginia. He is the chair of our Port Readiness Committee as the Port of Virginia. Perfect person for it. Linked up with Transcom, SEDC, linked up with the Coast Guard, the facilities, labor, all of those different issues all come together under that Port Readiness Committee. And I'll put this out to you right now. When you have very properly trained, very well calibrated men and women who adopt and believe in a concept that our strategic capabilities as a port are a no-fail mission, that is an absolute key to success, without question. So the area of responsibility right there, basically, it's the coastal waters of Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay, and all the interior rivers, James River, York River, Rappahannock, all the way up towards portions of the Potomac. Neighbored to the south by sector North Carolina, which did phenomenally last year uh, in the response to Hurricane Florence, the issues that Matsu were discussed there, John, John Dipper, there you are, Port of Wilmington and Moorhead City, correct? So ex coasty working there. All those different issues, sector Maryland, National Capital Region to the north. We all fall under the 5th Coast Guard District under Admiral Keith Smith, and he's the first one who really put it to me. The PRCs, the Port Readiness Committees, that is a no-fail mission for you, Kevin. You will make that work. We will get to yes. And we'll kind of close with reasons why. 
just to give you an idea of what we deal with, apart from the search and rescue, apart from the oil and pollution spills, things that we do, our commercial fishing, or, excuse me, commercial vessel cycle for vessels, about 5,200 vessels last year had to be vetted for arrival through to the Port of Virginia, Port of Hampton Roads, and also Sector Maryland, National Capital Region. Everybody's aware of those vetting requirements that go through, 96 hour notice of requirement, make sure the vessels are properly vetted for safety, security, environmental compliance, and also for security reasons. Just out of pretty much for last year, 3HVU, that's a high value unit movements. We support the United States Navy back to the world's largest Navy base for the movements of some of their vessels. 22 CDCs, certain dangerous cargoes, and nine high capacity passenger vessel escorts. Things are only growing here. The reconstitution of Second Fleet, the, the Navy is doing nothing but growing. The commercial industry, Port of Virginia, coal, all of those things are, co are constantly on the rise. And 17 high interest vessel boardings last year for condition of entry. Back to the military outloads. So under the Port Readiness Committee as a part of the AMSC, that is where we have every stakeholder, and I'll just put it to you this way, everybody who gives a damn about what this port means to this country is at the table. Everyone is there vested in that discussion about what this means. So the balancing act we talk about, yes, we're commercially very successful in the Port of Virginia. Yes, there's search and rescue, there's national security interests. When it comes down to it, that no-fail mission about our ability to operate as a strategic port comes down to this concept that I will keep in everybody's mind as we go throughout the day. You can have young man, young woman, a service member who raised their hand, swore an oath to protect this country in theater without the equipment they need to do their job. If that doesn't rivet you to the concept that this is a no-fail mission, I don't have nothing for you. But what I say is that right there is those clear lines of communications under the guidance of Mr. Burkett over there with everybody talking, we've had some pretty good successes. And we've had some challenges. We've been working through some issues. We've had some very good tabletops. And I tell everybody, if we go into a tabletop, if we go into an exercise and we don't come out with a huge list of lessons learned, that's a failure. We need to get better constantly, consistently. And that's something that we're always working towards. If we go into our first movement that we had back in December, that was a pretty good success. Did we learn some things? Yes, we did. As we move further, working with Transcom and SEDC, working with all of those port stakeholders, i.e. those who give a damn and understand the importance of what our ports mean to this country and our national security, we're going to get better. And we're going to continue to get better. So it's an honor, really, to serve as the captain of the port. And well, I say that from the standpoint that I get to work with thousands of men and women who really get it, who really understand what this means. And I think that's my last slide. And I look forward to questions. And thank you for very much having me on the panel. OK, thank you, Kevin. Uh, and we'll hold questions to the end of our panel. And uh, you'll be able to come up. So just make a note if you have a, uh, a question for Captain Carroll. And, and also, thank you for your service. Yes, Captain Carroll, you. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was born and raised in, in Central Texas in a little farming community uh, called West Texas, right in the heart of Texas. And I never even realized when I moved to uh, Houston that there were such a thing as ports or ships moving cargo, you know. So I think, and I challenge AAPA, you know, who, was, who, who talked to us this morning, Kurt Nagel, to, that we need to do a, maybe a better job of educating those people that are inland, the, the importance of ports and the, especially the importance of strategic ports, and uh, we can educate those, uh, those folks that are maybe in Lubbock, Texas, or, or Oklahoma City a little bit more to the importance of ports. So our next speaker, is Michael Kashner. Uh, uh, Mr. Kashner serves as Vice President, Government Services for Landstar Transportation Logistics. He represents Landstar on the Board of Directors and Executive Committee of NDTA and as Chairman of the NDTA Surface Transportation Committee. And the Port Subcommittee is under Michael, so he, uh, he's, he's giving us a lot of direction as to how we would like to proceed in the future as Port Subcommittee. Mr. Kashner is a retired Army Colonel has more than 30 years of international experience in transportation and logistics management before joining Landstar in August of 13. He served as the Chief Military Advisor to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense of Transportation Policy. He earned his BA in communications from Salisbury University in Salisbury, Maryland, and later a master, 
Masters of Strategic Studies at the Army War, Co War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He lives in St. Augustine, Florida with his wife, Kathy, and two children. So, Michael, All right. take it away. Hey, thanks very much. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me on the panel. Uh, again, it's an honor to be up here with these very distinguished uh, panelists and representing the surface modal carriers of the defense transportation industry. So I wasn't nervous at all until they told me that I had to flip my own slides, so this usually doesn't go well. So far, so good. All right. So this is the synopsis of, uh, of the panel. It's the, probably what you saw in your, uh, you know, online when you looked at, the, uh, you know, at, at this meeting, and uh, it, it's what's in your, in your handouts and whatnot. So I see my task as the panelist is the part in green, specifically you know, the trucking industry, and how does the trucking industry work with the ports, or what, what do we need to do better, what are, what are our challenges? So in order to do that, I think it's helpful to understand how the trucking industry is organized, or perhaps better stated, disorganized. All right. So kind of a busy chart there. Um, but the trucking industry is literally the most diverse and fragmented industry working interstate com commerce today. You can see that there's three and a half million truck drivers out there. Those truck drivers work for 1.47 million carriers. They carry about a million and a half carriers. Okay, that means the carrier's got authority under the Department of Transportation to operate as a carrier. About half of those are private fleets. So they work for the company that owns them. It's like Walmart or Target or Amazon. Okay, the other half, about 777,000, actually are for hire carriers. Okay, there's your, your Swift Knights and your Landstars and your Mercers and things like that. Um, and that's the space that the Department of Defense operates in. Okay, you, you utilize the four higher carrier fleet, so about 777,000 carriers. 95.3% of carriers operate 20 trucks or less. Okay, 91% operate six trucks or less. Okay, so, so my point to all this is that the Department of Defense, you know, through U.S. Transcom and SDDC, have about 600 carriers registered with them, and that's across all, all types of carriers. That's ex express carriers and le less than truckload carriers and vans and, pla you know, flatbeds and step decks and, uh, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole piece. And about half of those guys are brokers that don't own any capacity at all. So when there's a surge, okay, and we're doing things at scale, we have, we have the supported deployment, SDDC is going to their 600 and some carriers who are going out to these 777,000 other carriers that we have in our networks, okay, in order to get your capacity. The upper right quadrant of that slide kind of shows where the utilization is, and you can see that flat line, that was 2018. We were at 100% utilization, so if there was an available truck, it was being utilized. Okay, now we're down about 97.3%, so still really busy, and by the end of this year, it's going to trail off to about 93%. Um, that's still a really, really busy industry. So in order to support surges, we're, we're all busy supporting commercial customers. So just like the ports are. Um, so in times of war, we've got to reach out to those other capacity providers in order to bring you know, the, the forces to bear, the capacity to bear that, that the Department of Defense needs in order to get things from the forts to, to the ports. Okay, so with that, this is kind of what I see as uh, our challenges, and, and the number one thing, I, I, I think, hopefully I painted a picture for you with the previous slide, that it is a fragmented, crazy industry, and command and control, it's not like we've got one button or one microphone or one you know, telephone that we can get in touch with our entire fleet or our entire subcontractor fleets. Um, so command and controlling this thing from the carrier to hundreds of military installations to you know, dozens of ports through hundreds of thousands of carriers is, is, is very, very difficult. Um, what I'm seeing here is different than, <laughs> than on my page. Okay, um, so, so, so port, thank you. So port access, um, again, very segmented, diverse industry. Most carriers, believe it or not, don't go to, to seaports and most carriers don't historically support the Department of Defense. So accessing the ports just like accessing bases is a challenge. Not every single driver has a TWIC card. 
Um, so when you actually do do one of these movements at scale, you, you've got to have an expedited way for those carriers to get off and on bases. It, it seems to me that it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty sound thinking that if it's got a tank on the back of it and it just came off of military insulation, it had to go through the process of getting on the military insulation, it's probably pretty safe that, you know, to, to, to bring him onto the port. Um, so, it, yeah, we talked about the credentialing. Um, labor, uh, you know, longshoremen, are, are, are they trained? Do, do they know how to get, the truck drivers don't onload and offload the equipment from the, from the vehicle, so, you know, do they know how to, you know, drive M1 tanks and Bradleys and M88, you know, re retrieval vehicles? Um, I, you know, all, all this stuff is stuff that we've, we've talked about a, a bunch already, you know, enough staging area, right? You gotta get the trucks in, you gotta get them onloaded, you, you, you gotta get them out. Our strategy to support a lot of Department of Defense moves is really to round robin our trucks, especially things like at uh, Fort Stewart, say, in, in, uh, you know, or, or uh, Tacoma, uh, you know, Fort Lewis. Things that are close to, to the seaports, we're just going to round robin the, the, the trucks. So it's key to get those things offloaded and, and, and back out again. Um, my my uh, battle buddy here, General Farman, says we've got to test fire this. Um, so yeah, practice, practice, practice. You know, there's a lot of ports that we haven't used in a long time, and honestly, there's probably a lot of carriers we haven't used in a long time. Um, so we need to we practice this, rehearse it, write it down, do you know after action reviews, and and, and get better. Um, and then the final bullet here is pretty much everything I've been talking about is what what the trucking industry's challenges are with the ports. Um, what I'm not familiar with and don't have a good idea of, and what I'm asking everybody in here to do is to get with Ernest or get with me. Um, you know, get a business card. If there's things that the trucking industry is doing to frustrate you at the ports, uh, and it's something that we can work through committee at NDTA, by all means, please bring that up to us. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Ernest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mike. So our next speaker, uh, Major General Steve Farman, Commanding General of SDDC. I really don't need to introduce him. Uh, prior to assuming command of SDDC, General Farman commanded the U.S. Army Security Assistance Command, uh, USASAC. Uh, USASAC leads the U.S. Army Material Command Security Assistance Enterprises, which comprises multiple organizations and people to build partner capacity and support and strengthen U.S. global allies partnerships, critical to achieving strategic readiness. And as I was reading through uh, General Farman's bio, I, I noticed, uh, General Farmer, what's it been, 33 years? 33, in, yeah. 33 years um, in service. Most of your bio, the word transportation comes up frequently throughout that entire 33 years, which is pretty commendable that you've stayed pretty much within the transportation ranks uh, of our industry, and which shows why you're doing such a great job with SDDC. He graduated from University of Richmond, Richmond, Virginia in 1986 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history and was commissioned into the Transportation Corps. He holds a master's degree in national security and strategic studies from the Naval War College. His military education includes the transportation basic and advanced courses and the United States Naval Command and Staff College. He completed a senior service college fellowship in the first military fellow at the MIT. Uh, Center for Transportation and Logistics. In addition, he attended the Joint Forces Staff College in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, I introduce General Farman. All right, hey, thanks Ernest, I really appreciate it. So Ernest is my wingman for the Seaport Subcommittee, and my other wingman here is Mike Kashner. Uh, he's my co-chair of the Surface uh, Committee, which the Seaport Subcommittee falls under. So I'm, I, I'm in good company up here with my, and certainly with Captain Carroll. Uh, and, and my teammate over here, Larry, uh, at the port. So again, uh, looking at what we were t to talk about as a panel, and I, I really wanted to get on this panel for this reason, because it's not just about working with ports. What I want to key my focus and my points on is operationalizing strategic seaports as a key readiness lever. What are we doing to operationalize these seaports so we can take it to the next level? And, the, and, and I think the reasons are, are pretty clear. I mean, Admiral Busby talked a little bit in his remarks about how we're in great power competition. We have all these things going on in the world. We got Russia, we got China, we got North Korea, we got Iran. We got, it's hyperactive, it's hyper competitive. All that is going on. And the bottom line is if we're gonna do things at scale, we're gonna fight and we're gonna go to war by, with, and through the ports. And so it's 
absolutely essential that we operationalize what we're doing at these key nodes and this key terrain. And, and I think we're going to get a lot, you know, I'm really excited about what we're going to get out of this. So looking at uh, a couple exercises coming up too that I didn't mention earlier, we had the 80 BCTs that I talked about, which is always on a, on a natural churn. But there's another exercise coming up called Defender 20, which is going to be similar to the return of the forces to Germany, if you will, back in the 80s in Cold War days. It's, it's the 21st century version of that. So that may or may not have been in the numbers that Colonel Evans mentioned. So another important reason why we have to operationalize our ports, because we're going to have to push a lot of combat power over there to Europe, which deters what's going on with respect to Russia. And then there's Defender Pacific, which is going to do something very similar in the Pacific side, which obviously has effects towards China and things of that nature. So we have to be very, very effective in terms of what we do through our ports and all the intermodal activities and actions that occur there. So I wanted to give you a few examples of what we're doing to operationalize ourselves at these ports. The first thing we are doing is we have what we call speed of war moves. So in the last year and a half or so, we've, we've done six. We'll, we'll actually tag a brigade combat team move as a speed of war move. And what we mean by that is we're synchronized with forces command. We're synchronized with the division and the core, and everybody's on board, and they're saying, okay, we're going to execute this move at the speed of war. And so we have one coming up in August, you know, with 2-1 CAV that's going to move out of Fort Hood and go through Jack's Port and go over to Europe. And, and these are important moves. We average, you know, from Fort, from, you know, the camp, post-camp, to the foxhole, anywhere from... 36 to 40 days in a speed of war move, and that's from Fort to Foxhole. So we're always looking to shave time to see what we can't do to grade ourselves if we have to move at the speed of war. So with this move coming up with 2-1 CAV, we have uh, several other objectives tied to this, so we're going to put a lot of focus on it. One of the things that we're looking to do is, is issue a, what we call a surface tasking order. It's a STO, a surface tasking order. The, our air component has what's called an air tasking order. People are familiar with that. We're trying to create the same thing on the surface side of the house. What this is going to allow us to do, right now it's an analog version. It's, it's a port call message. What we're trying to do is digitize this and put this inside our, our joint operational planning system, which is a high side piece, and, and that allows us to flatten the move. So if we have to do this at scale, every battalion commander, brigade commander, division corps commander can see their moves and all the echelons that move in time and space inside this system. So as if it ebbs, if it shifts, if it flows, that, you know, they can see that happen. So what we hope will occur with this is it'll breed commander-centric behavior. So in other words, we don't have people racing to the railhead that shouldn't be there because, you know what, I just got to be at the railhead. And what happens is if, if they get in front of somebody else, it can mess up the lift that we've programmed for that. So if we're going to do things at scale, we have to, you know, in an intricate way, integrate and synchronize uh, this, this methodology. So this surface tasking order is, is going to have initial operating capability for this speed of war move. We're going to test fire that. And if it goes well, we intend to go full operating capability for all the 80 moves that we do in the fall, so in October. And, and, and this is a game changer. Uh, Force Com, Forces Command, which is... 80% of the Army is in Forces Command is on board with this, and we feel that this is really going to change how we can execute operations at scale. There will be some air gap transfers that we have to work with our commercial carriers and partners because there is a classified you know, system that I'm talking about, and we're going to work our way through that. But more importantly, we should have better integration and synchronization with our commercial carriers and partners. Another thing that we're doing on the speed of war move is we're using a way in motion system. So this is, these are systems that you put at the power projection platforms, and Admiral Clark had that chart up there. It had the PPPs, the power projection platforms on them. The Army's invested in this. We're going to put these way in motion systems there, and what will happen is we'll get the dimensional data correct at the post camp. And so when it leaves the post camp, it goes right through the port at speed. And we're going to work with our carriers and partners so they can observe how we're going to bring this to life so we get the trust factor high so that they know that dimensional data is going to be accurate, but most importantly, that can really bog things down. We don't want people reweighing things at the port, you know, when we weighed them already at the post camp because we don't trust 
the systems we're using. We have to breed that, and that will allow us to, to push the throughput a lot quicker. We're going to do this at the speed of war move. We already have some of these way in motion systems at other post camps, and we have more being purchased. So once we prove that it works in this nice Petri disk, we're, we're going to expand that to all the missions. That helps. Our biggest reconciliation issues for speed of finance and documentation are dimensional issues. And everybody in this room, I think, feels that because if the dimensions aren't right, the stove plan's not right. If the dimensions aren't right, then we have to do reconciliations and carriers don't get paid and we don't get paid by the service and so on and so forth. So that will speed things up. And then one of the last things that we're looking to achieve on a speed of war move is we're looking at putting uh, sensors on rail cars uh, to enhance our ITV, if you will, in terms of how we track uh, rail. And so we were talking about precision scheduling and ITV of rail and our ability to see that in real time is very important, especially if we're going to go to war at scale. So we're excited about this speed of war move uh, in August. And if any of you in this room are tied to that move, there's going to be a lot of eyes on that target. Uh, and, and we are looking forward to, you know, bringing that to life. One of the other things we're doing to operationalize strategic seaports is what, uh, what Kevin Carroll, Captain Carroll just talked about, and I thought you did an excellent job of laying that out, the port readiness committees. So I have a lot of brigade, battalion commanders in the room, command sergeant majors and brigade commanders in the room that, are, that make up the, the command and control system for SDDC that are integrated into these ports. And I have told each one of them that they are going to nest with their Coast Guard teammates and we're going to bridge, we're going to make sure we put a lot of wind in the sails of the Port Readiness Committees. I've personally gone to a Port Readiness Committee meeting and talked to the team because I want to show the emphasis there and I've also sent an email out to my, my colleagues, my level, to all the Coast Guard teammates, Admiral Smith being one of them who you mentioned, uh, and all the district commanders. I pushed an email out, you know, about three weeks ago talking about how we really want to work together with you to make sure we're putting in the wind, the right wind in the sails of these PRCs. Because CONUS is a contested space, it was already mentioned, uh, and it is not a sanctuary, and we have to bring more and more people inside the tent, in my view, and we have to do more repetitions of PRCs because the world is too, moving too quickly uh, and dangerously, and we don't want to have to build relationships and stuff in a crisis. If we already are there, we're going to move a heck of a lot faster. Uh, Stevedores. Uh, I had a great conversation last night at the reception with Ports of, Ports of America and, and CPA, uh, uh, the Cooper uh, teammates there of America. Look, one of the things that I, that's on my mind is if we got to do things that scale off all three coasts, are we going to have the stevedoring prowess available to do that? And do we need to get eyes on that target? We have to understand what our stevedoring prowess is, and maybe we've got to come up with a holistic training strategy to make sure that we can call the ball in the right way so we can push, we have the right people trained to drive the right equipment or do what we need to do at scale. So that's something I think we can take as an action coming out of this, and we've already talked about on the subcommittee bringing our labor teammates into that subcommittee so they can be part of that conversation. Another thing that we are doing is uh, we are allowing our commercial carriers and partners to come into a classified setting. And so if our carriers and partners have clearances, uh, we have forums outside from even this week, outside the subcommittees where we bring people in and we talk about an op plan and we'll lay out, you know, the challenges that we're facing. We'll lay out the volumes that we're having to deal with. And we have, you know, whether it's Mike Kashner sitting here talking trucks or our shipping uh, agencies, our rail teammates, everybody's in there and we're showing you inside the tent. And more and more we want to bring our commercial carriers and partners inside the tent to show you what we're really dealing with if we have to do this at scale. Where are those vulnerabilities? Where are those capabilities? That type of thing. Another thing that we're doing that we're getting great effect out of is we execute rock drills. Those are rehearsals of concept, ROC, rock drills, at these different ports, when we haven't used a port in a long period of time, we will execute a rock drill, rehearsal of concept, and what happens is I go out there, my whole team's there, we put the map on the floor, we lay this out, we have our commercial carriers and partners that are involved in the mission there, we have the whole team of teams from the port there, all the intermodal players, everybody is there. We, I just did one recently, two and a half weeks ago at Port Wanimi, 
and it was absolutely fantastic. I have one at the end of this month at San Diego, and when we pushed cargo out of uh, the Northwest and we did it out of T5 at the Port of Seattle, we did the same thing. So we're doing a lot of this on the West Coast, but anytime we identify a port, we're gonna test fire. It's a strategic port, or if it's an alternate port, we're gonna do these rehearsals of concept. And that really synchronizes and integrates and brings the team of teams together to really figure out how do we do this at speed and how are we gonna to pull together as a team to make it happen. And it builds those three ships I was just talking about. Uh, a couple other quick points. Uh, reserve component. I talked about how that's our lever for total force integration. We have them aligned to all the seaports along the edges. So quite frankly, if the balloon goes up, they're within two hours. All those units are within two hours of a strategic seaport and they can be there very, very quickly and rapidly. And of course, we lay things out on who goes where with respect to plans. So having playbooks, you know, having those kind of plans, having a contract playbook in place, how are we gonna do port support activities? These are the kinds of things that are important for us to be able to operationalize our port activity. Just last week, we did a cyber TTX at the port of Beaumont. Not we, it was more of a transcom Department of Homeland Security. Uh, exercise, we provided the, mm -hmm. the area uh, with our Beaumont teammates. And, uh, and again, we're still waiting for the outputs from that, but I've heard nothing but very positive things. But it gives you another example of how we're operationalizing ourselves on the protection front, so for cyber and mission assurance and things of that nature. Um, two more quick points, and then, I'll, and then I'll toss it over to Larry here. One is, we talk about, you'll hear the term RDDs, requirement delivery date, uh, quite a bit. And uh, one of the things that we need to, I think is important for our seaport teammates to understand and our intermodal players is, uh, required delivery date is when it's supposed to be at the end objective. Like when is it supposed to be, if it's coming back to home station, when's it supposed to be at Fort Hood? Why that's important is usually when it hits the node, the seaport, there's a certain amount of days we have to get it from the seaport to Fort Hood. All the stuff has to close at Fort Hood at a certain time. So the mission doesn't end at the seaport. I think you all realize this. I just want to make this a fine point. What's really important is the intermodal action on the back end so that we can thread the needle and get that to Fort Hood because until the combat power closes there, we haven't achieved the required delivery date even though the ship may have arrived on time at the port. So that's why this intermodal action and this activity and this synergy is so important and that's for pitching and catching. And then also uh, it was mentioned during Colonel Evans playbook or um, panel, uh, hurricanes. I mean, just as Colonel Evans alluded to and I'll just foot stomp it. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons through these uh, climate issues that occur and uh, we work a lot of playbooks. And so, you know, right now we already know for all the moves we've planned through the summer and hurricane season, if something's gonna happen, what time we're gonna call the ball to shift to another port. We've synchronized that with Forces Command and we're working our way through that. So again, we're trying to stay, what I like to say, left of boom, you know, which is boom being the crisis. We wanna be way out here on the left because that's where we win. And everything about this conference is winning out here before we get into doing dive and catches and all those and sliding into home everywhere we go out at these ports. That's what we're trying to mitigate is the dive and catches and reacting to things at the ports. And it, believe me, with all these players colliding there, it can happen. Um, and I, I guess the last fine point I'll, I'll mention is just reiterating port diversification and the strategy to test fire not only the strategic seaports, but the alternate ports. So even if you're not a strategic seaport, that doesn't mean you're not gonna get some action. You know, we'll put some stuff through. You could be on the playbook or we, we can push stuff through you as well. But all these things combined should just give you a little bit of a flavor and a taste of what we're trying to do holistically to operationalize what it takes to make this key, uh, this key bring this key military lever, this readiness lever, this capability for SDDC to life. And the only way we're gonna do it is by all of us understanding that and working together. So again, thank you very much and I look forward to questions. Thank, thank you, sir. Speed of war, uh, you know, we're, we're in the process of, of expanding our rail infrastructure at the Port of Beaumont. We had, we had basically one rail line coming in and out of the port um, and and uh, with Chris Fisher's uh, leadership, we were able to uh, talk the city into a street that's adjacent to the port, 
and uh, we'll soon be investing millions of dollars to bring another rail line into the port so we can, we can move both ways in and out of the port, which will assist when they launch those trains from Fort Hood or Fort Polk or wherever, uh, those trains can come into Beaumont knowing that there's not a unit train waiting to go out of the port once this, uh, this new rail infrastructure is, is uh, in place. So uh, this is something all strategic ports look at continuously. I'm not, we're not the only ones. Uh, I know Port Arthur is constantly uh, looking how to improve, as is Corpus Christi. And it, this is just something that will help support SDDC and, and U.S. Transcom. So our next panelist is Larry Kelly. He serves as Port Director and CEO for the Port of Port Arthur in Port Arthur, Texas. His career to date involves many aspects of the transportation industry, including rail, marine, trucking, facility terminal operations. Beyond transportation op operations, he is actively engaged in state and federal transportation policy and planning, so important to ports and our mission. Occupationally, he is a certified logistics professional and a professional port manager. Larry has undergraduate and postgraduate degrees from Lamar University in business and industrial engineering concentration and public administration, respectively. He's currently a graduate candidate for a master's degree in port and terminal management. Texas natives, Larry and his wife, Melissa, reside in Port Arthur, Texas. They enjoy travel and spending time together. They have a daughter, son-in-law, and most proud of a two-year-old granddaughter. And I, I, you know, I, was, I, I sent Larry a text this morning before our panel, and I said, how long has Port Arthur been a strategic port? And I was thinking it's maybe four or five years, and he pounced back 10 years. It, it seems like yesterday, Larry, yeah. that you guys were appointed as a strategic port, and, and Port Arthur has done a fantastic job with uh, uh, adapting to SDDC and Transcom's uh, needs, and uh, it's really good to have you guys as neighbors down Artists, there. I, I can't thank you enough, one, for your, specifically for your efforts of helping stand this committee up. I think it's important, and, and thanks for the opportunity to serve with such a distinguished board here. Uh, you're absolutely right, and I'll try to provide a little different perspective than, than Chris did this morning. Uh, there is obviously some overlap in these in these sessions, but I think it's kind of important. It kind of advances the dialogue as we move through the course of today and, and tomorrow as well. So try to avoid some of the duplication, but I think it's more conversationally is how we advance this and how we move this ball along. And I'll tell you, from, from our port, you're absolutely right, Ernest. We've uh, been a strategic port where actually one of the newer ones, I guess there's been Gulfport since then in the past couple of years. But for us, it represented a modal shift for us in, in embracing that. And I think that's a lot. And if I were to have be able to take this audience, and we know we have some fellow uh, public port authorities here in the room, but if I were to address our, our port group, I would put forward that message that it needs to be done with our eyes wide open and with direct caution. And, and one thing about seaports, uh, one of the things I, General, I heard you say is talking about um, the role of uh, the superiority and one of the things I think as a nation was we have to maintain our economic superiority because otherwise we become a target and we become weak and I think because of our success as a nation we're also still targeted. Um, port Seaports and uh, a plug for our AAPA and our Texas ports guys one in four or one in five dollars of our nation are generated in one way or another across our seaports and so in doing that one of the things that we become hopefully very well at is moving cargo. And it could be a container, it could be a bulldozer, it could be a tank, or it could be a helicopter, um, or it could be a piece of project cargo. So, so with that, you, we wind up with some degree of acumen on the ability to be able to design and operate ports. And I think it's critically important, and I, and I put this out to you, and, and to the ladies and gentlemen in the audience, I, 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 uh, you know, we're sitting here, we're not far from Langley, and gonna hear the the sound of freedom flying over. I want to tell you something. What I'm hearing in this room, I hear a lot of it here too, the sound of freedom. And for the efforts that you do to help uh, force project into theater and potentially, you know, even domestically if it's necessary, or in times of need. And we haven't talked so much about humanitarian aid, but I know that many of you have participated in those roles in Haiti when we had earthquakes and unforeseen disasters that may happen due to, to changing changes that happen in our environment. I say, I say that to say that when we're looking at these ports and to the hats off to the folks of the TEA, we enjoyed our meetings when we meet with them, is the importance to when you validate these ports, make sure that they are structurally capable, right? Uh, I think it's important that we, we do. We Once every five years, we perform a structural analysis on the port. I think uh, 
Colonel Evans talked about a tank falling in the ocean. Uh, that would be one of my worst days is the, the uh, dock falling into the, uh, into the, uh, the ocean there. Uh, so it's certainly something that we want to try to prevent, but also in preparation for resiliency. And, and as Chris pointed out, the, what we went through with Hurricane Harvey and all our other natural disaster events, and we're not done with them. We'll have, you know, whatever the next one's going to be, it'll create some dis disruption, but it's of a generally a temporary nature. Ports are generally built. Uh, pretty strong and it's more about the rail connectivity, the road connectivity that you get there that you probably find the greatest degree of disruption when you're operating one of these. You know, with these, with these BCT moves that we've talked about and the and Port of Port Arthur last year did quite a few, um, some of the things that I can certainly pass along that I think are critically important and I see some of the, the men and women in this room that help make that happen. Uh, Colonel Centello, I'm looking at you right now, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what, where, it came, where it comes to pass is with these PRC meetings, is where you're sitting there. And, and you know the party's well in advance. It's not, hey, glad to meet you today, and now we're working hard. It's, hey, how are the kids doing? And you develop those relationships, the trust that you, that you discussed, and having those cell numbers and, and those informal networks. And that was one of the takeaways from that cybersecurity TTX the other day was the local uh, relationships that exist and I think they're just as critical and just as important to these activities for a commercial port yeah we're a commercial port and we're out there trying to trying to to make a go of it and ports serve uh, we'd like to tout ourselves as an economic engine uh, in our local communities and I'm going to talk about a local perspective I'll, I'll say to this I think for the purposes of what we're talking about here about being an operational lever we're more like that transmission in that engine. You're converting power of one sort to another. And it may be multimodal. It may be from a train to a ship or a ship to, uh, you know, to a truck or something like that. And that all happens in that port. And I'll add a couple more layers to that. I would put pipelines in there too. Uh, uh, Director Fisher and, and Port Arthur, we both, uh, we're both handling uh, liquid energy and we're seeing a lot of growth along the Gulf Coast. And I think that may be a, a touch on the topic on one of the later panels as far as what's the competition like. You know, how is that going to impact us? As, as ports are growing with increased container, containerization, maybe on the East Coast or the West Coast, or maybe on the Gulf Coast, where we've seen certain increases for, um, uh, you know, energy that is, is takeaway capacity is being created along the Texas Gulf Coast, we certainly see this. How does that all factor in? And those are things that certainly I think we all need to watch for. Um, the, the points that I wanted to make about the, the BCT moves, uh, is, is the after action component is listen, listen to the Donald Santillos, you know, and, and, and I'd say that to U.S. Transcom and SDDC, the guys that are on the ground that have the eyeballs on it, those are the guys that are seeing what's going on. Uh, maybe we may not as ports be able to offer it in the best vernacular, but we want to be able to provide that feedback too. We have a unique opportunity as public ports to sit and watch, and we get to watch how different brigade groups move through. There's a, there's a philosophy, there's a culture of each one that's a little bit different, and we can also kind of help plug the holes where we've seen, hey, this is a good place where, where a bottleneck happens. And, and I'll just throw a few of these out there. Uh, all well in, meaning and intended, and uh, they, I offer them up as opportunities to improve rather than direct challenges. But, you know, our federal partners with uh, CBP, make sure the cargo can get through there. Make sure the cargo clearances are there. Make sure all the way down to, as we talked last night, sir, that the rail inspector knows which way the twist is on the boom and chain. And what does that mean to you? On these BC2 moves, they're moving at the speed of war. And, and, and as it was put to us, you have to be in the box by a certain amount of time. You know, what does a day or two cost when you've got to get a, a longshore crew back out to refasten cargo to get back out? Those are the things that uh, many of us remember the aim small, miss small from a line in a movie. That's where it becomes very relevant. And that all happens in that port. And that's why I really think that this, this session, and that's why I'm trying to give out some of the practical aspects of it that's like somebody in there, I, mean, I see a few people taking notes, uh, that, you know, those are the few of the things that, doggone, we really need to watch out for. And Mike, I, I'll tell you, I'm a recovering truckaholic. I used to run a trucking business, right? I, I, I came from the 3PL public warehouse trucking into the world. And, and there's challenges there we have, and, and, it, and you touched on it. It's, it's like the, uh, twic, having the Twit cards. You know, most of the truckers in America never touch a port, you know? And then we get them in, and we have to work through escorts and make sure that we're in good compliance with all the, the rules and, and, and such. And it, it is an important role that we need to do. And the other thing is, um, on some days that we have observed, you know, occasionally, if um, 
if you need to move 70 trucks in a, in a day's time, well, that's great. You hope to spread it out over the whole day or they all show up at five in the morning, you know? And so, so there's opportunities, I think, and it comes from having this dialogue for us to be able to work together, to be able to sequence it. When you talked about meshing it where the, where the railhead, you almost got an amen out of this Southern boy. Uh, when you talked about where, the, where you push it to the railhead as fast as you can, but you can't do anything with it. And that's where the synchronization occurs. So. Anyway, I appreciate your time on this. I'll certainly want to turn it over for questions and, and, um, and great company. Thank you, sir. Ernest, can I throw an yes, alibi sir. in here? Absolutely. Just, uh, just want to toot a horn for Larry here. So we, we did a thing called, we call them EDRIs, Emergency Deployment Readiness Exercise. Uh, the last one that we've done recently, yeah, the last one we did was with 10th Mountain Division coming out of New York, and it went into Port, Port Arthur. So, I mean, Port, and, and then it was shooting around to the Joint Readiness Training Center. So that emergency deployment readiness ac exercise, which just happens. I mean, it's not like we get advance notice. It's just like all of a sudden the phone rings and it's, you're off to the races. You know, it's a speed of war check and Port Arthur stepped up to the plate. They did just an amazing job. And of course, the whole, all the intermodal, intermodal partners all chipped in on that. But that's an example of why we gotta be getting this right now because the phone's gonna ring, right? And if we gotta do an EDRI or we gotta do two EDRI simultaneously, we want to be shaking out all the kinks on these things soon, uh, or now. And then the last point I just want to mention is, could the battalion commanders and brigade commanders just stand up, please? Did I have an SDDC? I just, so they're all here in the audience, and for, for the seaport, uh, for our seaport teammates, uh, captains of the port, everybody, and all the intermodals, these are the folks that Larry was talking about that you're going to deal with that echelon. Uh, and, Incoming too. Some of them are tag teaming because there's going to be a change of command coming up this summer. So we've got a few others. But there are all the CONUS battalion and brigade commanders here in this room, and they're the ones that are going to be interfacing with you directly to achieve all the things we're talking about in this room. Putting wind in the sails of the Port Readiness Committee with the captain here and everything else. So it, that's why they're here taking all this stuff in. But I thought it was important to. And they'll be on the panels. A couple of them will be on panels. You can go ahead and sit down. A couple of them will be on panels uh, coming up, so feel free to hit them with a lot of questions because they know what it really takes uh, to make things happen at the tip of the spear. So I'm sorry for the no alibi problem. there. No. Thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And, and uh, you know, you mentioned uh, towards the end there the, the, the Twit card thing and, and the trucks and with Mike and everything, and I looked over at uh, Captain Grigiak here, who's our director of security, and he just cringed at that because <laughs> it is a constant issue. You know, the truck shows up, doesn't have a Twit card. Now, Colonel Santillo has worked that out in, in Beaumont anyway, where they've got escorts available to be able to get those guys into the port. So, but it, it's again, as General Farman says, speed of war. You know, that little bit of a slowdown, you've got to work out some kinks to get around those issues to make sure that that equipment moves to the uh, to the hook. Or, or to the to the ramp of the ship to, to get it on board the ship. So we open it up for questions. If anybody's got any uh, any questions, please come forward to one of the two mics there. We've got a few minutes left. We're going to go over a little bit, uh, Admiral Brown, but we've got a, a, a little bit of time for questions. I'll start out uh, to General Farman. Without mentioning names, General Farman, uh, are the challenges for strategic ports and their interaction with the different modes of transport, truck, rail, et cetera, different for each coast, Pacific, Atlantic, and Gulf. Can you, uh, yeah. you know, do you have any, uh, any thoughts regarding that? Yeah, I do, and, and that's why we're test firing these and doing the port diversification, because the answer is yes. I mean, the challenges are very different in the Gulf to the east to the west coast. I think most recently we've been test firing a lot of ports on the west coast that we don't tend to use a lot. Uh, I think one example off the top of my head that I can share is we wanted to, we, we had it in our mind that a plan was going to push an armored brigade combat team through the port of Oakland, okay? And that was something that, you know, if we hadn't checked it out, we might have been working a plan to push a lot of things through the port of Oakland. Well, we went to check it out uh, and actually physically check it out with a test fire. We come to find out that the rail doesn't go to the port at the port of Oakland, you know? It's a container port if you got it the rail comes in in a unique way and then you have to so we had to when we actually did the move and we still did it on time to Korea we had to come up with some orchestration of trucks that brought stuff from the port 
over to the rail, get it on the rail, and then send it all the way across the East Coast. So again, we shook these kinks out over the course of this. We still met the timeline, but we all walked away and said, you know what, uh, the, the plan, the tip fit, as we call it, time phase force deployment data, uh, we may need to change where we're, we're not putting heavies through that port. You know, that's not going to make a lot of sense. Uh, it's more of a sustainment port, more container port. So again, our ability to test this, and then when we do these rock drills with our intermodal partners, we shake a lot of these kinks out, or we start to find out where the warts are early enough, and then we come up with a game plan, and then in the strategic holistic, we may alter the real plan game plan and use a different port that might, that's better tailored to something. So I think Port of Oakland's just one example. Um, and again, they still, the team came together and we made it all happen effectively. So that's the strength and power of this thing. But we found out something that we needed to find out way ahead and before all of a sudden we were flowing a lot of stuff through that port. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's, the answer is yes. All right. And we need to do more of it. Very good. So, uh, no questions from the audience. I can't believe it. We got General Farman up here. <laughs> right you can ask him enough from this him is right already. before lunch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can ask him yeah. any question you want. Oh, so, uh, uh, I've got I've got one more here uh, for Mike. Uh, is there a better mousetrap when it comes to moving military freight across the nation's highways to strategic ports? And how can or how can state governments or how can we assist uh, in, in lobbying state governments to improve your ability to do your job when dealing with military cargo? Is there any, any thoughts on that? What would make it easier? I have no easier? idea. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, better mousetrap is, is, is tough, but um, of, of how we would, how, how, how the industry would better support, uh, you know, deployments. Um, especially no-notice deployments. I, I, I think with working with state and local governments, though, um, we're actually working through, uh, NDTA is working through uh, SDDC, Transportation Engineering Agency, to put language in a new um, uh, transportation bill that during times of, of crisis or emergency that certain things are waived or, or, or bypassed or expedited, such as permits for, you know, over-dimensional, overweight, you know, vehicles. Um, we still need to do, go through the permitting process and make sure we're not taking down bridges with, you know, equipment that's too heavy or taking down, you know, overpasses. But there should be an expedited process. Um, so we're, we're working on those kinds of things. And, and that really happens at the, at the state level with all the state departments of transportation. So, you know, how, how do we nationally figure out how to get with each of the, each of the states and uh, help to get, kind of get through some of these challenges with, uh, you know, expediting d d deployments? Okay. Maybe port subcommittee can can work work on that uh, on that challenge for the for the future. Yes, sir. Hi, John Young with the American Association of Port Authorities. I uh, work a lot on infrastructure issues, and just to add on to that question, I think one of the areas, a new tool that's in the toolbox, if you will, is the state freight plans that were authorized in the trans last transportation bill. You may not want to put everything in the state freight plan, but I think you know these are becoming the freight planning tools of the future. And it would be something that I think you guys should be weighing in on and thinking about. And actually, it's a great coordinating tool for uh, especially the 17 uh, strategic ports and then also the alternates. I know Admiral Busby's uh, uh, agency has worked closely with us on state freight plans, and we use it as you know, a way to plan for our infrastructure investments. So I think this would be a good next step. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Can I? Can I make one last quick point, sir? Just, uh, no, and I just want to do this, <laughs> sir, really quick. It's just, uh, we, we throw this term BCT around a lot, right? Brigade Combat Team, and I just want to put a little context on it. So it comes, you know, there's a heavy one, there's an armored heavy one, there's a light one, there's a striker which has wheels, there's a combat aviation brigade. So that goes back to the earlier question, why we have to test fire most of these. And they come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them are 100,000 to 200,000 square foot moves. And sometimes there's, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 pieces. Sometimes these moves are three vessels. Sometimes they're seven vessels. So again, each one of these things has its own three-dimensional, multi-dimensional layers to it, which require an immense amount of coordination 
through all the different portals that we're talking about. So when you just, just to try and put some context on when you hear a brigade combat team, that's a, that's a lot of pieces, you know, over a thousand up to 2000 rolling stock. We even have, even when we bring enablers, like a lot of logistical things bundled together, they can be the same size as a brigade combat team with a lot of other nuances to it. So again, the complexities, when we say BCT moves, I just wanted to paint that picture. Sometimes it's three ships, seven, that kind of thing. All right, I'm sorry, Admiral. I just wanted to clarify <laughs> that because we're going to be throwing that term around a lot, and I just wanted to give some details there.